Please welcome Billy and Darcy of the Smashing Pumpkins. Hi, how you doing? Good evening, good. everyone. Good Hi. evening. It's good to have you here. I know we're doing this tonight because it's hard to, due to the tour, nail you down on a Sunday night. And so you've taken some time out to be here on Thursday. Yeah, we're usually praying on Sundays, <laughs> and it gets in the way. Rock, we rock and roll and, and the prayer don't mix. That's true. So Thursday's a better night for all this. Yes, it's a pagan day today. Excellent. Um, the show went well last night in Detroit? Yeah, the shows uh, have been tremendous. I mean, probably some of the best of our of our 10 years. And uh, we're pretty much just playing a lot of the new album. And we've never had such a tremendous response to new material as we've had for this album. Yeah, the, uh, the critics have been raving in all the different cities about how well it's been going. And um, obviously what's taking some of the spotlight is the fact that uh, the charity situation, uh, where like in Detroit... Um, Haven, which is the charity that was chosen there, all the money goes to Haven. It's not just, you know, in in, the, in a lot of shows when they say a portion of the proceeds go, you've taken all the money to go right to the charity. Actually, it's actually surprisingly, I didn't realize this, but I guess it's never really been done before. No, it has not on this, not on this scale. Um, like last night, we raised hundred thousand dollars for Haven, which is a a physical and sexual abuse center in in. Uh, in, Detroit. Uh, Detroit. I know. I, I was I, w- I was going to say the Detroit area. Uh, and then uh, you know, we raised like $500,000 the other night here in Chicago. So we're, we're, we've already raised a million dollars in about the past, I guess it would be about two weeks. Yeah, in Los Angeles, I think the total was over four hundred thousand dollars. Yes, um, it's been it's it's been amazing, tremendous, uh, really rewarding, and uh, I don't mind sharing the spotlight. In fact, uh, you know, at, for once, maybe it's uh, even better that it's a little bigger than what we're doing. You know, let me just read some of the charities though. Some in some of the different cities, uh, like in San Francisco, uh, the charity was the East Bay Agency for Children. That was on uh, June thirtieth, and uh, in Los Angeles, uh, the charity was. Um, Five Acres Boys and Girls Aid Society. How did you, in all these cities, come up with uh, the different agencies? How did you select all these? We had our management compile a list of uh, different, you know, worthy uh, agencies, and uh, we went through them, and all of us sort of handpicked the ones that we thought, you know, were sort of... uh, I don't know. It's really hard to choose one over the other, but the most... Um, embodied, the, embodied the spirit, I think, is what we were looking for. Yeah, like, especially in situations where there were some charities that might normally be overlooked by, uh, you know, people who donate frequently. And, uh, by the way, did the charities, uh, all of them that were contacted, you know, did they, they had no idea this was coming, did they? I mean, it's... No, this is a... Indep- this is totally everything that's been done on this tour is independent. We've, we're self-generated. We have no corporate backing, nothing like that. We're we're doing it completely on our own volition. Now, they must be thrilled. I mean, have they heard? Have all the charities in all the cities heard of you? You know, yeah. were there cases where it's like, who are you guys again? Or- yeah, th- but uh, but p- put it this way: you call somebody up and you say, "We'd like to give you a hundred thousand dollars." <laughs> they find out who you are pretty quick. Um, it it you know it's cool. We don't. I mean, the way we look at it is. You know, these people are the real heroes, the people doing this work. And so, you know, they got better things to do than worry about, you know, what we're doing. And uh, we're we're happy to support them indirectly or directly. Yeah. Um, You'll also uh, be playing for us a little bit later, won't you? You brought instruments. We're going to muster up a a tune. Very good. Something a little spur of the moment. A little spontaneous. No, it's actually we've been in rehearsals for weeks, but it'll give the appearance of rough and jagged emotion. Excellent. You know what they say, perception is reality. Um, That's right. Going back to the uh, the tour thing and the, the charity thing for a moment, um, and speaking of radio, uh, it seems like radio is kind of getting into the spirit of this as well. I know during the Los Angeles show, some people from uh, our Modern Rock Live affiliate in San Diego, 92.5, came up and had auctioned off tickets on the air. Instead of just giving the tickets away, they actually auctioned them off and then right. presented you with the money. Yeah, it's fantastic what some of the stations are doing because they're, they're really in the spirit of what we're trying to do. All right, let's go to the phones and uh, find out what some of the adoring fans have to say. Mm-hmm. Jessica, you're on the air. Hi. Um, Hi, Jessica. How many songs didn't make it onto Adore and what were they? Mm. Too many to remember. Yeah, there's about <laughs> 15 of them. And why? Yeah. Why? Yeah, Darcy's still asking me why. There's about 15 songs. I'd say maybe about six acoustic songs. There's a couple heavy songs, and there's a couple kind of, they sound like a door, but they're kind of maybe not as good as some of the songs that are on a door. So 
a good a good mix of uh, of uh, you know it's like that that uh, you know the toys that Santa didn't want to use and they all go, had to go live in that land and be sad before Rudolph came and saved them. That's where all the songs are. So will they they'll show up someday someday somewhere? Yes. Uh, hmm, I don't know. I'm I'm anti B side right now. I'm sure that'll make fans angry, but yeah, but these it's, songs it's they... become such a commercial tool by so many people that I'm kind of. I'm not kind of against it right now. Yeah, but someday down the road, way far down the road, you're going to go, these songs, they had life. We gave them breath. They must come out at some point. Well, it's a weird situation, you know, when you get to a point where, you know, on Melancholy, we released 28 songs in the album and then 28 additional B-sides. So that's 56 songs. And then to see fans on the Internet complaining, how come there aren't more songs? You get to kind of a frustration point where you start to think, well, maybe it's not so good to release all these songs because people are losing focus on, on what the most important material is, which is obviously the stuff on the album. So, yeah. Fans saying, you know, how come there aren't more songs? And critics saying, well, don't you ever feel that you should edit yourself? Yeah, edit yourself down. <laughs> don't you think that you put out too much material? Damn so, those critics. We can't, we can't win. Can't that's win. A, no. That's, yeah, that's, that's just true. our karma. If you put out too many, you put out too few. All right, Jessica, thanks for the call. Steven, you're on Thank the air. You. Hey, um, how long did it take you to produce your first record? Uh, Gish. That was recorded in 1990 and 1991. I think it took roughly about four and a half months. And uh, I was still working, and Darcy was still working at the coffee shop, and I was still working at the record store. So I had to kind of do double duty between jobs and doing the album. All right. Steven, thank you. Ryan, you're on the air with Billy and Darcy. Hi. Uh, who's your favorite? Hi. Who's your guys' favorite band? Who's our favorite band? Yeah. Hmm. Bands or band? Either. It doesn't matter. Plural. I like a lot of bands. Probably my favorite band of all time is probably the Beatles. But if you're asking about current bands, I don't know. I like Beck. Hanson. Spice Girls. Mm, Savage good? Garden. Usher. Celine Dion. Usher. Celine Dion. That's what we used to pump ourselves up in the dressing room before we go on stage. My heart will go on, but we replace all the words with our own kind of cynical brand of humor. With different organs. Yeah. My, was my, liver, <laughs> my liver will go on. The uh, you, you wrote, um, what, was it uh, in high school that you wrote for the uh, high school paper and you were predicting or used to write interviews? Right. Yeah, I have to dig this. I have to dig this up somewhere. But I, I used to write for my high school paper, and, uh, and in 1984, I published an article where I predicted that the three bands of the future were Metallica, U2, and REM. And you were correct. Not well. bad. Well, I'm predicting right now that we're the band of the future. <laughs> That's true. You are. You are the future. All right. Let's. Uh, we'll come back to some phone calls. Let's play another song from Adore. Tell us about uh, Daphne Descends before we get into it. Hmm. Mm. Let's see. It's about one of those girls you know who's going to hell, but she doesn't want to. But down she goes. Alrighty then, down she goes. Daphne so descends. Who wants to go to hell? Uh, some I of know us a couple do. people. <laughs> <laughs> I know a couple people who seem very hell bent, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Modern Rock Live, The Smashing Pumpkins, another song from Adore. It's Daphne descends. We're all going to hell. Well, not all of us. <laughs> we could, only you. Only me. We could turn this into goth talk, but it's okay. We won't. Uh, Taryn, <laughs> you're you're on the air with Billy and Darcy. Hi. Um, I was wondering. Hi. Oh, okay. I was wondering. After Adore, do you plan on keeping like the same frame of mind and music style for your next album to come? Even if we intended on it. <laughs> it would be really hard to keep the same frame of mind. A lot of, a lot of people are very confused about why we did an album like Adore, and so I'll, I'll go over it one more time. Uh, we wanted to step away from what we were used to doing because we felt that a lot of people had started imitating what we were doing and had taken a lot of the energy out of it. And then also that alternative rock was kind of coming to a point where nobody was really doing much anything new. We don't want to just stagnate and keep doing the same things over and over. Right. So we kind of went back to our roots and went back very simple and started over again, which is where we started before we ended up with Gish and then ultimately getting more and more sophisticated through Siamese Dream. So this is really the first album and what will be another series of albums that get further and further out. So if you really want to try to trace the lineage, I mean, you, you can go back to, you know, if anybody can find the bootlegs of the stuff that was out before Gish, you know, this is kind of like the album that's before Gish, and then the next album will probably be re a return to, a, you know, a heavier style, but more experimental and more futuristic. At some point down the road, your albums will start to resemble those of Philip Glass and Laurie Anderson. 
<laughs> Don't count it out. Don't count it out. We shan't. You know, there's been a lot of talk about Philip Glass during this tour. Really? In fact, my sister went to lunch with him yeah, in London. We, we saw Philip in, uh, in London, so there you go. There's synchronicity for you. There you go. Funny you should mention it. Oh, and a uh, good question from Taryn. Thank you very much. Uh, Heather, you're on the air. Hi. Why did you write Lily? Why did I write Lily? Yeah. Well, I'll give you the quick version of the story. Uh, I used to live across the street when I lived with my dad when I was like 16 or 17 from a girl. And uh, she kind of went out with me for a while, then she broke up with me, and then I became obsessed with her. So I used to climb the tree in front of my dad's house to try to see in her room to see what she was doing. And so I was just going to make a joke, about, a joke about how you were a stalker, and that wouldn't have been too far off. Huh? No, I was, I was a teenage yeah, stalker. I was a, te- <laughs> I was a teenage <laughs> Lily stalker. Lily or I was a teenage stalker. Well, notice how Lily <laughs> rhymes with Billy. There's your mystery. Next question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, going back to the uh, the album and the frame of mind, you know, it was interesting. I read this great interview with you in uh, Billy and Guitar World where you were talking about the whole point was to be very spontaneous with this album. And it was like literally a case, as you say, of you writing the songs in the morning and all of you recording them that day. Um, and then you sort of stepped back after that process was done, realized, well, maybe it's not quite finished yet. Mm-hmm. Um, how right. long a span of time was that between... You know, finished, and then, well, maybe we should go back and take another look at this. Uh, you're kind of confusing it a bit. Oh. Um, honestly, it, 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 I think as we went along, we figured out ways to do that quicker and get to, get to the conclusion quicker. I think we started off in a more simple frame of mind, and then as we went along, we became more sophisticated and started going for that sophistication. Uh, was the feedback that you were getting, I mean, was that was a lot of this based on feedback you were getting that maybe you had stripped it down too far? No. Okay. No. I, I think I think that, it, you know, it's a very materialistic world, and I think everyone thinks in terms, not necessarily of art, but in terms of commerce. And I think it's really easy when you become a big band for people to think in terms of record sales. And the Smashing Pumpkins has always been about music first. And it's, a, you know... And we were, we're not going to change that for anything. We're not going to change that for anything. And we're unapologetic about everything that we've ever done because we feel it's led us in a bigger and brighter direction. So a door is the next step for the Smashing Pumpkins. And I always point back to Gish in 1991. A lot of people did not understand Gish in 1991. And it's very easy album to understand in 1998. And I think a door is very similar in that vein. I think it's a little ahead of its time and people are having a, trouble understanding where it sits. But in three, four years... When people start copying it, like they copied our other albums, then it'll make a lot more sense. But, you know, it's true, too. True fans don't care. I mean, true fans are with you no matter what you do. If you want to experiment, that's fine. They're there. Mm-hmm. You know, those well, you people know, will always be there. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't really I don't really necessarily buy into the concept of true fans anymore. I think that the the it's hard to be a true fan because there's just so much negativity in the world, negativity in the media. You know, and not many people are allowed to be heroes. And a lot of the fun basically has been taken out of rock and roll. You know, I think we have a lot of fun with our records and we have a lot of fun with our tours. But you never read about it because people want to focus on all the negative things. At least what's great about the charity tours, how negative can you get about charity? So for once, at least people are focusing on the positive. It's great. Yeah, it's true. It's a great flanking maneuver. Ah, we'll do this and... No, 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 you got that wrong. It's not at that at all. We're doing what we want to do. You know, we're doing what we want to do. We believe in it. It's not. It's not in any way, shape, or form a political move. No, no, saying, not calculated at all. But no, but but we've been accused of being calculating to the point where, you know, everything we've ever done has been judged and questioned. And so what I am saying is to anyone who would question that, this is out of the goodness of our hearts, you know, because if anyone would want to question it, we would be out promoting our album and not worrying, not worrying at all about charity at this point. Right. Well, let's listen to another cut from the album, and uh, then we'll come back and chat some more and take some more phone calls. Um, tell us about Pug before we uh, hit the button, as they say. Hmm. Well, it's all about selling out. <laughs> there you go. All right. You guys still there? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Very good. Let's go to the phones and uh, find out what the adoring fans have to ask. Anne, you're on the air. Hi. I was just wondering um, if you're getting a bigger turnout from fans for this charity tour that you have for your past tours. That's a good question. Uh, we're we're not playing as big a sized venues, so it's really hard to judge. But uh, yeah, pretty much, you know, everything's selling out um, just like normal. It's uh, honestly the feeling and the excitement's, you know, the same or more. Thanks, Anne. Anita, you're on the air. Hello. Uh, 
Um, from the door, what song do you enjoy performing live the most? Mm-hmm. Depends on what mood you're in. If you're feeling happy or sad or right. angry or... Okay, let's say you're sad. What song do you like to play? Probably for Martha. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. I'd say for Martha, too. Yeah. That's probably one of the highlights of the show, I think. And if you're happy? Probably Ava Adore or yeah. Daphne Descends. I'd go with Ava Adore. And if you're angry? Probably Ava Adore. <laughs> And finally, hmm. if you're hungry. Uh, probably. Uh, Do we have any food songs? Transmission, oh, which is the last, last song in the set, because after that we go eat after oh, the see. show. That's a radio transition. <laughs> Apples and oranges. Apples and oranges. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting that you should say that, because it's just ready to go. We happen to have apples and oranges from the album. Do you want to talk about it before we uh, go to it? Well, some people are like apples, and some people are like oranges. And you can't compare the two. You ready? You ready to hit the phones once again? Bring it on. Bring it on. Okay. Christian, you're on the air. Hi. How do you decide on your album covers? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, on this particular album, uh, I spoke at length with uh, my girlfriend, Elena, who did the photos in the album about what I was looking for conceptually. And then she tried to turn that into a, into a cover. And I think she got pretty close to what we talked about. Um, I really think that the picture that she took and the other picture she took really embody the spirit of the album. and that's I'm really happy with that. So, it, But it's hard to put it in literal terms, if you know what I'm saying. But uh, what was the concept that you were describing to her so that... That's a secret. Okay. All right. Shh, we won't go there. Thanks, for Christian. Uh, Michelle, you're on the air. Hi. I wondered, is there a way fans can contact you through an email address or fan club? Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> We're pretty unreachable at this point. I don't think point. we know the answer to that. We used to have a fan club. I don't know what yeah. happened to it. We used to be in contact a lot with fans, but unfortunately, when the band got kind of crazy big, you know, then you start getting a kind of a lot of lunatics. And... uh you know, I've had problems with stalkers and all sorts of other stuff. So, unfortunately, we can't contact with the nice people anymore because there's too many crazy people. That's what the show is for. To talk to the crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> to talk to everybody. Yeah, right. Crazy yes. people, whatever. There's no website? Wait a minute. There's no web. You're anti-website. How, how, do we, how, do, how do we know we were even on the radio right now, Max? We could just, you could just, this could be your own kind of personal You're right. session kind of moment. It's like that movie they made about He's the He's shaking fake. his head right now going, I can't believe these people. No, 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 you actually guessed the truth. It's like that movie where they faked the moon landing. We never really went to the Capricorn moon. Capricorn 1. Yeah, Capricorn 1. You know who was in that movie? O.J. Simpson. Oh, my God. How's that for synchronicity? Wow. Next call. Next caller. Tim, you're on the air. Yeah, I was wondering, how long does an average tour last for you guys? This isn't an average tour. Yeah. But all, an average tour is like 14 months. Yeah, 14 to 16 months was all the three albums prior. That's how long we toured on each individual album. Um, this one we're planning on only doing about four months, but there is a possibility we may go back out in the winter and, and do some more shows in America. This is actually 24 months uh, condensed into three. Yeah, we just we just did all of Europe, Australia, and Japan in roughly seven weeks. Wow, it was pretty hardcore, but um, we're seeing a lot of people in a very short period of time, which I, is really nice. I take it um, it sounds kind of like you're sort of happy to be playing some of the smaller venues again. Is that true? Well, we're really happy to be playing the way that we want to play in the places where we want to play and kind of really make the music work in the way we want it to work. It's I know that may sound a little kind of strange, but you know, there is a pressure on us to to play bigger places and to kind of try to maintain that, you know, super rock status. Uh our music comes first and, and we don't want our music to suffer and we also don't want to put our fans in a difficult position where they they feel conflicted between what we want and what they want 
you know, we, we understand that if you play a show for 15,000 people, they're going to want to hear a lot of songs that they're familiar with, and we don't want to be unfair and, you know, try to cram something down their throat that they may not necessarily want to understand. So a smaller show, I think, is, is a different atmosphere and lets the band have a little more freedom to play the new album. We, we did that on every, we did that on Melancholy. We did a small tour before we went out and did bigger shows, and that seemed to work very well for us. So we're kind of taking the same tact. And I think uh, if the, you know, everything works out with the album and people feel very positive about it, I think in, you know, five or six months, I could see us going out and playing big again. So, yeah, a lot of people actually probably don't realize that there is a difference, you know, especially in the in the uh, the tone, the attitude of the audience. You had actually made a comment, I think, early on about one of the the first times you'd played to really huge audiences, like thirty thousand people, that they seemed more distracted than you know when you're doing clubs. Yeah, but we have a lot of empathy for an audience, and and we you know we try to understand what it must feel like to be in the back row for your favorite band you know you don't necessarily want to be in the back row but at least you're in the building and it's very hard to kind of get music across to someone who's very far away and I don't think if we play if we tried to play a small concert for everyone who'd want to see a small concert I think that would be a full time occupation so it's very hard It's a, we have to make a lot of hard choices but I think at the end of the day our fans do understand why we're doing what we're doing which is to put the music first and we just refuse to be one of those bands that just kind of passes across your horizon for a year and then disappears into obscurity. You know, the, the, because the, our music is important, I think that's what makes us important. Look, we're only going to have to worry, like, some somewhere down the road in the future when you're being asked asked to play after the fireworks at a, at a baseball game. At that point, we have to reevaluate. <laughs> but that's many years away. Let's, uh... how, do you know, how do you know we're not doing that tomorrow? <laughs> Another song from Adore. It's called Tear. I would sort of say it's darkly epic. That's pretty pretty close. <laughs> it's supposed to be kind of like a, a film, but in a song. As opposed to what it was supposed to be. Which was a f song, song in for a film. A film. Yeah. Song in a film. Yeah. A film in a song. That, that song is actually a rejected song for a film. Really? Yeah. Which? We submitted that song and it was rejected. For which film? Uh... Anastasia, Walt Disney. Really? No, I'm just kidding. Oh. No, I mean, I, I don't want to tell. I don't want to say it because then people. I don't know. <laughs> what you said it every other interview. Did I? Everywhere uh, else, the oh, world let me, over, let me, let me and all of a sudden guess. you're going to stop. <laughs> uh, let me take a guess. Let me just you're throw gonna, out. You're going to guess. You're going to guess right. So, go ahead. I'm thinking. I'm thinking David Cronenberg. No, is it the uh, Crash? Lynch. Did, Lynch. Oh, David Lynch. Lynch. You're close though. Very good. Lost Highway. Yes. Really? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> that was an interesting movie. Still trying to figure it out. <laughs> we all are. We'll have to wait for the next David Lynch movie. Now, let's go back to the phones. Sean, you're on the air with Billy and Darcy. Um, hello. I was wondering, what is their favorite Smashing Pumpkins album? Well, you can ask them directly. That's like asking a mother who her favorite child is. You can't. Yeah. We love all our albums. If we didn't, I don't think we would have put them out. Um, each album means something special to us. So that's impossible to define. Are the links anyway? Are the later ones? I, I, I'm probably going to word this the wrong way, but let me just throw this out there. Correct me if I'm wrong. As you get more popular and you get further along, do you feel like the weight of the world as you do each album? In other words, you know, when you're first starting out, you're not that well known. The albums may become easier or. You know, you can just throw it out there. You don't think about it as much. I think it's kind of a six and one half dozen of the other situation. When you first start out, you're trying to make an album that's going to get people to really listen to your band and pay attention to you. Uh, at this point, when we make an album, we feel the weight of the world to live up to people's expectations, which are not necessarily realistic. So, gotcha. If you if you know what I'm saying, I mean, yeah. we're a pretty edgy band, and we're still a very alternative band, despite our mainstream success. And I think sometimes people lose sight of the, the fact. I, you know, I, it's like people will talk about us in terms of mainstream success. You know, our first single, the first line of the song, it's you that I adore, you'll always be my whore. That's not really a Celine Dion kind of line, if you know what I mean. Exactly. Marjorie, you're on the air with Billy and Darcy. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, how'd you guys get on The Simpsons? Uh, it was, we had to pay them a lot of money. It was a lot of money. I think they they think they charged about eighty or ninety thousand dollars per person. Per person. But you know they got a good thing going. They can name their price. Wait a minute. You had to pay them to be on the show. Are you serious? <laughs> What's the short version of Simpson? Simp. 
<laughs> All righty then. I can't believe you had to pay them. That's amazing. All right. Uh, let's well, it wasn't really that much. And yeah. it wasn't in, in, in like, dollars. Yeah, we had to pay Canadian. them. In, yeah. Canadian, so. Well, those are dollars, too. But 80 or 90,000 Canadian is like 75 U.S. So. <laughs> That's true. All right, we're going to take a break, and then we'll come back, and uh, you guys ready to uh, play, uh, play live? Are you, uh, almost. Also, almost? All right, we'll give almost. you a few minutes to set up. We'll take a break and uh, come back with Billy and Darcy from the Smashing Pumpkins on Modern Rock Live. Rock Live. It's uh, Billy and Darcy from the Smashing Pumpkins doing perfect from the album. The new album, Adore. Very good job. Excellent. Nice to, nice Thank acoustics you. in the studio there. It's a lovely studio. It's a very nice song. It's uh, uh, People may not know this, but this was supposed to be the song from Titanic, but yeah, <laughs> that honor went to uh, Celine Dion instead. Just think what could have happened. I mean, it might have been. It's kind of if you think about it, perfect. The, sh the ship is perfect, and everyone's going to have a perfect time. And sh down it goes. And here we are rearranging the chairs, the deck chairs on the Titanic. Jeff, you're on the air with Billy and Darcy. Hi. Did I you was, like I that, by the way? Did you like that? That little that was live in the studio. Yeah, that was really good. Okay. 
Um, I was wondering if you guys are putting out another uh, Euphoria video. He's Euphoria re- 2. He's referring to our video compilation from 1994. Um, we're planning on doing a documentary slash concert tour performance video, hopefully by Christmas, of the whole Adore tour. Oh, good. We've had someone on filming the whole thing, like everything. So we have literally every step of the way, including the making of the album on video. Now, does that make you self-conscious at all, having somebody like there with a the camera all the time? It should have made us more self-conscious, unfortunately. It didn't. Right, so there's plenty of incriminating stuff on it. It'll be entertaining. Very good. It's like It'll be like the Truman Show. <laughs> Lily, uh, Lily, sorry, Lily, you're on the air with Billy and Darcy. Hi. Did you say li- Lilith? Is this Lilith? Lily. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's the Lilith Fair it's calling. It's one of those pumpkin jokes. You know? If in the beginning your band didn't make it, what were your fallback careers, and did you have them in mind? Hmm. Hmm. I always thought I might end up as a street person. I was thinking history teacher. American history or European history? World history. World history. Yeah. Okay. You know what they say about history. What do they say about history? If you don't know it, you're doomed to repeat it. That's true. Okay. Thank you very much, Lily, for that phone call. We'll take uh, some more calls. Let's play another song off the album, though, uh, from the album, as uh, we we go deeper and deeper into the record. Um, We're going to play Crestfallen. Do you want to talk about this before we uh, go to it? Yeah. uh, Actually, this song was originally written uh, for Courtney Love, and uh, long before I helped work on the new uh, whole record. This is probably written about a year and a half ago, and uh, I was going to give her this song, and then she had some kind of tantrum or something and I decided it was better off with us so it's an interesting song in the sense that it was written originally written from the standpoint of a woman singing to a man but now it's a man singing to a woman okay our time is almost up tonight I can't believe it flew so fast but before we go um, we, got all, I, we got all serious see? no it's because we're old <laughs> which is it serious or old both. We're Both. old and oh. serious. Before we go, though, I do want to read about, I want to read some of the uh, upcoming tour dates and the charities that are involved. And again, remind everybody that 100% of the ticket price is going to the charity. Uh, you have a show coming up on the 12th this Sunday in Houston, and uh, the Houston Children's Charity is the charity there in Houston. Uh, July 20th, you'll be in Toronto. The band has chosen street outreach services there. Um, on July 29th, you'll be in Washington, D.C. at Constitution Hall. And uh, the charity there is the City Light School. You then move on to Boston on July 31st. You'll be playing the Orpheum up there. And uh, the charity there is the Children's AIDS Program. In Atlanta on August 4th, uh, Reach is the charity there. And also, you'll be playing the uh, Grand Old Opry House on August 5th in Nashville. Sure, uh, yes? We seem to, uh, we seem to have... Uh, I don't know. I don't think people know we're playing in Nashville because, uh, yeah, it, it's a little slow. and It's probably one of the only cities that's slow. And, and uh, we're playing an acoustic show at the Grand Old Opry. And uh, I, I just get the feeling that people down there don't know. So well, please come on do. down. We, Yeah, please. I mean, we want to see everyone. We we love playing there just like everywhere else. Okay, we urge, cause. We urge everybody to fly to Nashville, buy tickets, and go. The uh, charity there is the... The W O C. What? Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no you'd go be ahead. surprised. You'd be surprised. People drive like we we meet people all the time. Drive 12, 13 hours to come see shows. So okay, come on, the, come on down. The charity there is the W O Smith Nashville Community Music School. 100 percent of the uh, ticket price going to the charity. Thanks to Billy and Darcy of the Smashing Pumpkins. Thank you for uh, letting us snag you in between uh, tour dates. And thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll see you on the road, and we'll see you this Sunday again on Modern Rock Live. I'm Max Tolkott.